The first day I went up there into the pit, Dad took us the first day, and I'm not kidding you, it, <laughs> when I started to walk in there, and my little glimmer with me midge, I'd lit my midge, and all I could see in front of me was a little, little yellow light on the floor, and I couldn't see nothing round me, it was all black. I know there's people with me, I could hear them talking, but I couldn't see them. Oh, and the sweat, <laughs> the sweat started to come on me. I was really frightened, I was really and truly frightened. The first uh, place you come to was trustee sidings in the pit lake, and you used to sit down there for about five or ten minutes to get your eyesight. You come out of daylight and go into a dark room or a black room, you, you, I say you can't see properly. So you used to sit down there till you got your eyesight. So you went down what they call Derby's Incline, and it was about a mile long. Derby's Incline was driven deep into the hillside. The tunnelways and ironstone pillars formed a giant labyrinth that extended across several square miles. Branch lines descended into vast underground districts such as Stapleton, Number 2 West and Cross Keys. At 564 feet beneath Barnaby Moor, the long descent reached pit bottom. This cavernous chamber was the hub of operations. Water pumps worked round the clock to stop the mine flooding. More than 400 gallons of rust-red water were expelled every minute. From the engine room, the endless train of full wagons was hauled from the darkness beyond. The manager's office and the deputy's cabin were rooms simply hacked from the walls as was the blacksmith's shop and stable complex. These underground stables weren't for ponies like those used in coal mines, but heavy workhorses such as Cleveland Bays and Clydesdales. In the peak years, more than 150 lived and worked in the pit, the majority of which were brought back out only if sick, injured or killed. From pit bottom, the main wagon way turned eastwards and continued for a further two miles, running into numerous districts. Some of these were curiously named, such as Egypt, Kabul and Zulu. This was perhaps to honor those killed in the Imperial Wars of the 1870s and 80s, when these districts were first driven, or possibly the miners of the day were striking a parallel with their own daily battles at the face. The main wagon way then reached the far end of the pit and the Challoner district. Between 1879 and 1915, it was possible to walk from Eston almost three miles underground and emerge here to the north of Gisborough. Today, the company cottages on Wilton Lane form Challoner Pit's only visible remains. The reason that you used to get up early in uh, the district you worked in, if it was in the far end, that was Chandler, Chandler district, and it used to take you uh, anywhere an hour to an hour and ten minutes after you left daylight to get to work. Let's get cracking. Right, we'll get this lot down, eh? right. At the face, the miners worked in pairs. Their first task was to bring down any loose stone from the roof and sides. Go on, keep jam, get to me in They were eight right foot long, an inch round and they had a pinch on the end. That's all it was, 18 foot long, inch round. You had to pick them up with two arms and get them up 
and yeah, use it. It's all good. It's all good, show. Sorry to work. Come on. It may not come down, but you know somewhere up there's a key piece. But it's finding it, and it may take you an hour to find it. There she goes. And then all came down, as big as it grew, all down. Maybe it's all around you. And leave it the sort of hole. Can't you have your, on your toes then, eh? Oh, God, I. It was all danger. There was nothing, nothing at all about the bloody job that was easy or anything that you, you could like. And uh, then you'd, you'd go another day and all bloody day long, every piece of stone that you filled, you'd have to break with a hammer and wedge, you know. Some days you'd go and you'd fill extra bloody wagons and you'd come over and you'd think, you know, what, what a big man he was. But when you sat down and thought, what a bloody idiot you'd been, because you'd, uh, you knew, you'd flog yourself to death to do this sort of bloody thing. You were in there more or less because you were forced to. You'd sooner do that than be on the door. The door was about 19 and 30 a week, I think it was at the time, wasn't it? That was for a man and his wife. And in there you could earn about two pounds. The mine owners were so stingy the way that this is the way that it was for a miner. Everything was cut down to a very fine art. They knew it, the mine owners knew exactly what they, what they were going to pay them. And if they could get away with paying them less, they would do it. Somebody asked me a little while ago, what, what did you do for the canteen when you was in the pit? <laughs> they said, the canteen, you sat on the nearest bloody bit of sandstone you could see it. Had your bloody bait there out of your pocket. <laughs> Nearly everybody took jam and bread. That, that kept moist in, the, in your pocket. And if you didn't want a piece of jam and bread, you slung it away. Within seconds, it was on its way. Bloody rat had picked it up and taken it to wherever he lived. Oh, the bloody things I used to dread eating them. The buggers climbed all over the place. 